Okay, so here we're talking about accounting for business transactions. So we go through this uh, accounting uh, process here, or what they call the accounting cycle in Chapter 3. So here are your objectives, learning objectives. So first we're going to talk about the, the steps in processing transactions and the role of source documents. <clears throat> All right, so business transactions and events are the things we look at when we're preparing financial statements. When we're preparing financial statements, it's the accumulation of all transactions and events that have occurred uh, over a period of time that affect the accounting equation. And so this process starts with identifying each transaction and event from source documents, such as invoices, uh, sales tapes, things like that, uh, that affect the accounting equation. Next thing we do is analyze each transaction and event using the accounting equation to see what the effect of each transaction is on the accounting equation. If there is no effect on the accounting equation, then we don't do anything. But if, after our analysis of this transaction, it does affect the accounting equation, then we record the transaction in a journal, usually the general, general journal, but there might be specialized journals that we'll talk about in later chapters. And then we post the journal information into the related ledger accounts. From there, we prepare and analyze a trial balance, and we prepare financial statements. So there's one, two, three, four, five of the steps in the accounting cycle. There's actually nine and possibly even ten total that we'll talk about. So source documents, like I said, could be anything that helps you to figure out what the transaction is about. Sales tickets, bank statements, purchase orders, bills, checks, um, em employee earnings records. And there's more, I'm sure. So objective two, describe an account and its use in recording transaction. So an account is a record of increase and decreases in a specific asset, liability, equity, revenue, or expense. And the general ledger is a record of all accounts used by the company. And so, as far as asset accounts, it's going to differ from company to company, but, um, you know, there are some commonalities between companies. For instance, every company is going to have a cash account. Uh, they're going to have accounts receivable. They might have notes receivable. Uh, if, if they're, unless they're a service company, they're going to have inventory. They might have prepaid accounts supplies, and so on and so forth, uh, property, plant, and equipment such as buildings, equipment, land, might have intangible items such as patents, trademarks. As far as liabilities, uh, almost every company is going to have accounts payable. These are purchases made on credit, might have notes payable, might have unearned revenue, might have uh, accrued liabilities as well as in long-term notes payable. And then under equity accounts, you've got your common stock account. You're going to have dividends. You're going to have revenues. And you're going to have expenses. So here's your asset accounts. Here's an example of the types of 
liability accounts you you would have and here are your equity accounts now as far as equity is concerned again you're going to break this down it's not, stockholders equity is the overall account it's broken down into these four categories or four accounts All right, let's describe the ledger and the chart of accounts because the ledger is where you're going to keep uh, all of your accounts, asset, liability, and, and equity. And what what you have is this thing called the chart account, chart of accounts, which is a list of all accounts. And what it does, it in includes this chart of accounts includes um, a number out in front that identifies so it's for identifying purposes only the the account number for that particular asset in the ledger and so note the structure of this assets in this particular instance are noted as starting uh, with a one so it's the 100 series that are assets the 200 series are liabilities the 300 series are common stock retained earnings and dividends whereas revenues make up the 400 series and expenses make up 500 um, and you know good planning would say that you want to have some gaps in here in case you have a, a something that uh, would precede, for instance, supplies in between supplies and accounts receivable, and might be account number 120. And again, uh, what you'll find out is that these assets uh, and liabilities we classify them. We'll talk about that in chapter three. All right, let's talk about debits and credits and double entry accounting. So we use what's called T accounts in accounting. These T accounts represent a ledger account and it's used to depict the effects of one or more transactions and so each account has could be characterized by a T account the T account has three characteristics the account title is at the top of the T account you have the left side of the T account which is called the debit side you have the right side of the T account called the credit side. Now, does debit necessarily mean that when you debit something, you increase that the balance in that account? No, it it depends on the type of account you have. If it's an asset account, the debit side is going to be an increase in an asset account. Um, a credit to a an asset account would be a decrease but for liability liability account a credit to a liability account is an increase whereas a debit to a liability account is a decrease and then for the various equity accounts uh, revenue accounts are uh, credit balances expense accounts are debit balances so to increase a revenue you credit it to increase a an expense you debit it um, and then you know you have your common stock account that would be um, a credit to increase common stock and dividends are a special kind of expense account and so to increase an, a, a dividend account, you would debit it. All 
And so, so the, the normal, normal balance for an as asset, asset is a debit, debit balance, balance, a normal uh, balance, balance for a liability account is a credit balance. And then again, kind of uh, overall equity, you're going to have a credit balance. But again, you have to look at the, the various equity accounts to see what the normal balance is. And they do that here. Common stock uh, has a credit balance as, as its normal balance. Uh, dividends has a debit balance as its normal balance. Revenues, credit, and expenses, debit. And so, like I said, everything on the debit side, for instance, cash, increases the balance in cash, and everything on the credit side decreases cash. So, for cash, when we receive cash, we debit it. When we pay cash, we credit it. All right, let's talk about recording transactions in our journal and posting those entries to a ledger. And so, again, back to our uh, accounting cycle or accounting process. Step one is to identify the transactions and source documents or through source documents. We analyze those transactions to see what effect, if any, they have on the accounting equation. And if they have an effect, in step three, we're going to first record the transaction in a general journal, usually, as we are here. But like I told you, there there's also special journals that you could use as well. But starting out, everything you will do is in a general journal. So step three is record the journal entry. And each journal entry has certain characteristics. There is the date of the transaction. There is your debit which you enter first on the first line. And notice that it's to the left, to the very far left of the second column. And that's the, the, the account that's affected here. Uh, this guy, remember, uh, in this example, contributed $30,000 of cash in exchange for common stock. And so, um, you debit cash, and then, you know, the other part of this is that you're going to credit common stock. Notice how you always have the debit first and list that amount next to it. And so that's to the third column. And the credit... Notice how it's indented so that the person looking at this can know that uh, because it's indented under the debit, it's a credit. And notice how uh, the credit is put in a different uh, column. The credit is 30000 It's in a different column, the fourth column while the debit is in the third column. And the other part of that would be, and they don't show it here, but there would be an explanation as to what the transaction is about. Step four, you're going to post this entry to the ledger accounts affected. In that first account, the, the, the accounts affected are the cash account and common stock. Now, um, most companies, if not all, use a, an electronic or uh, they use software, accounting software. Even a small company can use QuickBooks. 
and um, it does this automatically, step three and four. And so when you enter something in, when you enter a journal entry into the proper accounts, then it will simultaneously post those in the proper ledger accounts, the proper ledger, uh, ledger accounts for the first transaction is the cash account and common stock account. So again, notice you've, you've got four different things going on. You've got the transaction date, the titles of the affected accounts, the dollar amounts, and an explanation of what the transaction is about. You want to put enough information in the explanation to explain to someone who is not familiar with the, the transaction what has occurred. Now, while the T accounts are useful illustrations, we actually use something that looks like this in uh, actual practice. When, you know, again, this is normally a software program, and so this is what it would actually look like. But for uh, analysis purposes, T accounts are a good way to start. So notice here, in the general ledger, you have your cash account, <clears throat> and it shows the, the date of transactions. It shows you the PR part is the reference back to the, the journal. And what that says, the G1 says that it's on page one of the general journal. And notice you have your debit and credit columns. And the balance keeps a running balance of the cash account, something you don't have in your T account. So, you know, here's what it looks like. This would be done simultaneously. De you know, you debit, cash, and credit common stock in the general journal, and then it would, the software would simultaneously uh, debit the cash account, the ledger account, and credit the common stock ledger account for 30000 All right. When you're, when you're processing these transactions, when you're doing your analyzing, you have to understand the double entry accounting uh, method. And so, again, you, you identify the transactions, you analyze to see what effect it has upon the accounting equation, you record the transaction in a journal entry, using double entry accounting. Well, what does that, what does that mean? It means uh, any particular transaction is going to affect at least two accounts. You're going to have a, normally you're going to have a debit and a corresponding credit to two different accounts. Now, could you have more than two accounts involved? Yes, but the, the double entry accounting philosophy says that uh, each transaction is going to have an effect on at least two accounts, maybe more. So here exactly two accounts are involved. And so they're just going through our transactions from chapter one, I think they add a few more. So step one, identify the transaction. $2,500 uh, cash is paid for supplies. 
What accounts are affected? Well, cash is reduced, supplies is increased. So we debit supplies, increasing the supplies accounts, and we decrease cash by crediting it. And so that's posted in the supplies account as a debit and in the cash account as a credit. And so they just go through and do this for every one of them. Identify, you know, analyze each transaction, identify the transaction, analyze it, record it, and post it. So, again, this is just stuff that they were talking about in Chapter 1. So I think every one of these we already covered. And now they add a few more. Let's see, this one was done as well. Here's a new one. Receipt of cash for future services. And so fast forward receives $3,000 cash in advance of providing consulting services to a customer. What you'll learn is from chapter three, recall that we recognize income when we provide a good or service. Here, we're receiving cash in advance of providing consulting services. So we have not provided the services. That's gonna be done in the future. And so what we're gonna to have to do is create not um, revenue yet because we can't recognize revenue until we provide the service we're going to create a liability called unearned consulting revenue and so we're going to debit increase cash by three thousand and we're going to credit or increase this new liability account called unearned consulting revenue Another example, we pay cash for future insurance coverage. Here, we're paying uh, $2,400 cash up front for 24 months uh, insurance policy, and the coverage begins December 1. And if you recall from the example, our year end ends December 31. Okay, so we're in business for one month before the fiscal year end here. And the bottom line is that we're receiving a future benefit from this uh, payment of insurance. We're paying $2,400 cash for 24 months worth of insurance. At the end of December, we will have used uh, or benefited from one month of insurance coverage. So in that next year, we still, and the year after, we, we have 23 more months that we benefit from this insurance policy, insurance coverage. And so we cannot expense this all at once. We have to create a, an asset account for the prepayment and so we debit this new asset account called prepaid insurance for $2,400 on December 1, and we credit cash for $2,400. Why do we have to do that? Because we're going to receive a benefit over more than one accounting period. If this were just, if we were just benefiting from this $2,400 payment, in the month of December only, then we would just expense it to insurance expense. But because we um, benefit from this 
prepayment. Over a period of time, we list it as an asset, prepaid insurance. Okay? And we'll see in the future here that at the end of December, we're going to expense, insurance expense, for exactly $100 of the $2,400. Here we purchase more supplies for cash, $120, so we, we would debit supplies and credit cash. We pay an expense. Um, utilities expense, so debit, utilities expense, credit cash, salaries expense, $700, and credit cash. And so after we've done all that, we've got at the end of December, all the ins and outs from the asset accounts, liability accounts, and equity accounts have certain balances. Some debit assets have debit accounts. Our liability accounts have credit balances. And depending on the equity account, you have debit or credit balances. Let's talk about a, uh, this trial balance. So the trial balance that we're going to prepare at this point is called a, an adjusted, unadjusted, excuse me, unadjusted trial balance. It involves three steps. What you're going to do, number one, is you're going to list each account title and its amount from the ledger ending amount in the ledger that's in, you're going to do it, put it in the trial balance. If an account's zero, you can put it in its normal debit or credit uh, column, or you could just delete it, and omit it entirely, as it says. Number two, you're going to compute the total of debit balances and the total of credit balances. And then three, you're going to prove or verify the that the total debit balances equal the total credit balances. If they don't, you have a problem. And you have to go back through, and while I won't go through it, it lists, I think, six ways to do this, to search for errors on page 70. Um, and that searching for errors, basically you just, you go, you work your way backwards. Um, well, what if, so you, you know, you have a problem if you, you're total debit balances of all debit balances account don't equal the total of all your credit balance accounts. Uh, well, does it mean that you've done it correctly if all debit balance accounts equal all credit balance accounts? Not necessarily, because you could you could put it in the wrong account in your analysis. You, you've selected the wrong account or accounts. Or if you transposed some numbers and you did it for both the debit and credit, you could have that problem as well. So just because debits, debit accounts equals credit account balances does not necessarily mean you've done it correctly. All right, so here's our example at the end of that month and year, December 31, 2017. And all our debit account balances equals all our credit account balances. All right, and here, if, if, you, if it's not the case, you have uh, different amounts in debit versus credit balance, 
credit accounts, here's what you have to do. You have to, to make sure the trial balance columns are added correctly, make sure the account balances are correctly entered from the ledger, see if the debit or credit accounts are mistakenly placed on the trial balance, recompute each account balance in the ledger, verify that each journal entry is posted correctly, and then verify that each original journal entry has equal debits and credits. So you're working backwards is what you're doing. Notice that the last thing you do searching for errors is actually the first thing you do when, when you're starting this process. Now, again, at this point, what you have here is it says trial balance, but at this point, what you'll learn in Chapter 3 is uh, if this is the year end, you've got to make certain year end adjustments. And so what you have here is actually an un unadjusted trial balance. And while you could prepare financial statements from this, you haven't done all you need to do at the end of the year per gap, which is accrue certain things. But anyway, if you prepare financial statements from this unadjusted trial balance, just realize that um, those financial statements would be non-GAAP at that point because you haven't made these adjusting entries at the end of the year. All right, and remember, here are your four financial statements. Income statement reports revenues, less expenses, and the resulting net income or loss. Statement of retained earnings reports how equity changes over reporting uh, period from net income or loss and from any owner investments or withdrawals for the period. Uh, balance sheet reports the financial positions, which is the, the uh, types of accounts and the balances in asset liabilities and equity accounts at a point in time. So it's a snapshot at the end of that company's uh, financial year. And the statement of cash flows gives all the incoming and outgoing cash flows for the period. So here's your income statement for this company. Here's your statement of retained earnings. Notice you have to, to do, you have to prepare these statements in this order. You have to start with the income statement because you can't prepare the statement of retained earnings until you know what the net income is because that number gets transferred to the statement of retained earnings. And then you can't prepare the balance sheet until after you prepared your, statement, your first two statements, income statement and statement of retained earnings because retained earnings is the number you put in your uh, balance sheet there. Note some things here, dollar signs are not used in journals and ledgers. It's presumed or assumed. Dollar signs appear in financial statements and other reports such as trial balances. The usual practice is to put dollar signs beside only the first and last numbers in a column. When the amounts are entered in a journal, ledger, or trial balance, commas are optional to indicate thousands, millions, and so forth. Commas are always used in financial statements. Companies commonly round amounts in reports to the nearest dollar or even to a higher level. Okay, so that's it for chapter two.